All right, so we read before the prayer in Exodus chapter number six. And th this is a continuation, I believe, part five today of a series we started, I Am That I Am. This is a name that God gave Moses to give to the children of Israel. And it gives the picture of a God who becomes, a God who would become whatever necessary to redeem his people. And all that would happen in the book of Exodus, Exodus, when you look at that word, that name, think about exiting, because that's what it literally means, an exiting, a coming out of bondage, a coming out of, of, of uh, captivity. And everything that God did in the book of Exodus in bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, which means house of bondage, is actually a picture of what Jesus has done for you and me. When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, we find that everything that God did in Exodus, everything that he did in bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt was all a picture. It all pointed to what the Lord would do through us. Egypt is a type of sin. It's a type of bondage. The Red Sea, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 6, is a type of baptism. So we, we came out of our bondage. We came out of our sin by the power of our Redeemer, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus we came through the waters of baptism, which was portrayed in the Red Sea. We come to the wilderness, which is a type of world. The world we're living in is a wilderness. But in that wilderness, we find the faithfulness of God, who shows up as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, who gave manna from heaven and water out of a rock and showed the children of Israel his faithfulness as he led them to the land of promise, where they would be led not by Moses, but by Joshua into the promised land, Joshua is the old covenant name of the new covenant name, Yahshua, 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 translated in English, Jesus, which means God saves. It's Joshua that leads the children of Israel on into the land of promise, which is a type of heaven. So for those of you that have accepted Christ and have followed him in baptism, welcome to the wilderness. That's where we are right now. But we need that cloud by day. We need that pillar of fire by night. We need that supernatural provision called manna. Manna was not bread. The word manna means what? When God gave them bread, they said, what? And they were shocked by the power of God who literally dropped bread down from the sky that gave that bread its name manna, which means what? Is there anybody in here under the sound of my voice that's had God show up in such a way that left you saying, what? I mean, it just left you in awe of what he could do, amen? That's the kind of experience that God wants us to have in this wilderness journey as we make our way to the promised land. The promised land is heaven. And I know many of us have sung about it and ready to go there, but not so fast. God's got a work for us to do in the earth realm, amen? Hallelujah. So the whole journey is a picture of our faith. And the reason I say that, and the reason I cite 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is because I need you to see that this is not just some event that happened in the Old Testament that we're not supposed to know anything about that's not applicable to you and I in the New Covenant, because it is. Because ultimately, we see the heart of God in verse 7 of Exodus 6 when he says, I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you... A God, if you're one that writes in your Bibles, underline that statement, I will take you to me for a people and be to you a God. This meant that God was going to consecrate his people. He was going to separate them unto himself. And that's the will that the Lord has for you and I today, that we live sanctified, separate unto him. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. When we look at what the Lord was saying to Moses regarding the children of Israel, he gave them a word, and I'm going to quote uh, Exodus 3, verse 12, when he says, certainly I will be with thee, and this will be a token unto thee. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve or worship God upon this mountain. With that in mind, if you would turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, because here's the scene of that mountain. And here's the point that I want to continue to make in this, is that the Lord was not just delivering the children of Israel from bondage or from captivity. He was bringing them unto himself. 
And I've said for a long time and just had this conviction that I feel like many believers know what they've been saved from, but they don't recognize what they've been saved to. And I've not just been saved from my sin. I've not just been saved from my past. I've been saved to a relationship with my Father in heaven. I've been saved to him. Hallelujah. I know in my sin, Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what I used to be. But Colossians 1.27 says, Christ is now in me, and that's my hope of the glory of God. So we have gone from sin and coming short of the glory of God to being forgiven, redeemed, saved, to walk in the glory of God. What is the glory of God? It's the manifestation of his goodness. It's the manifestation of his will. It's the manifestation of his word. It's when he reveals himself in our life. It's when he shows up through an answered prayer. It's when he shows up and gives you peace that goes beyond your understanding. It's when he shows up and, and gives miraculous provision. When you begin to see him move in your life. It's when you open his word and you see something you've never seen before. It's when you praise him and you feel his tangible touch on your life and you know that he is with you and that he is not left you, nor forsaken you. It's any time you experience the Lord in your life, whether that's privately in your home, driving down the road in your car, or whether or not it's in a worship service. It's when the Lord manifests himself, manifests his presence in your life. That's glory. And that's what the Lord wants us to walk in every single day of our life. Hallelujah. So not just being saved from my past, from my sin, but being saved to a relationship where he is revealing himself to me. Now, when we get to this mountain, Mount Sinai, where the Lord had even uh, sanctified that mountain, and he gives Moses these commandments to give the children of Israel, uh, I want to just briefly reiterate these Ten Commandments and, and, and just why they're so important and, and really just highlighting the first one. Because the Lord says here in chapter 20 of Exodus, verse 1, God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So the Lord would give Moses and his people ten commandments. And I just want to briefly go back over this, because I know I spent a lot of time on this for the last two weeks, and I'm not going to spend that much time, honestly, just, just briefly. But the first four commandments, for those of you that have not been here or tuned into our broadcast, the first four commandments all deal with our relationship with God, not having any God but him, to not worship any image that's, that's from heaven, earth, or in the sea, not to take the Lord's name in vain, and to remember the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week, to remember that day, what it represents, and to keep that day holy. That day represents God as creator. That day was separated when the Lord created the heavens and the earth in six days and then rested on the seventh. That's what the word recreation means. Recreation could be broken up by saying recreation. Recreation. It's revisiting creation. God was glorified, glorified in what he had done for six days, glorified on that seventh day as the creator. For me as a kid, not knowing a whole lot, you know, about necessarily the Lord of the Commandments. I just knew on a Friday evening when my dad would come home, take a shower, shave, and put on his good britches that, you know, we would go out to eat. In my mind as a little boy, daddy got paid. Daddy got paid. We're going to enjoy the fruit of daddy's labors when we went out to eat after a long week worth of work. And so the Lord works six days, creates the heavens and the earth. On the seventh day, he rests. It's no different than you laboring and then stopping to enjoy the fruit of your labors. That's what God did, and it's a commandment that he gave every one of us. Then... When you get to that fifth commandment, that fifth one is parents, teach your children honor. Children, honor your mother and father. And this was the first commandment that was given with a promise of a peaceful and whole and complete life. The, 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 the last six commandments all deal with how we treat each other. All six of the final commandments deal with how we treat each other. 
beginning with, beginning with parents teaching their children in the home. Because God, what God was doing is he was putting the, 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 the obligation of education on the parent. That it is your responsibility to teach your children these commandments and my word. So you can take two columns and separate the Ten Commandments. The first four all deal with my relationship with God. The last six all deal with my relationship with my neighbor. And I'm going to make this point and I'm done reiterating. When a society has forgotten God, when a society has, got, has stripped God out of its uh, sphere of influence, which this society we live have, have done, when you take God out of a person's life, when you take God out of a society, you're not just going to be left, up with, left, out, uh, uh, left with empty churches. You're not just going to be left with less religious influence. What you're going to be left with is the violating of the last six commandments. You're going to see broken homes, children that don't know the truth, dishonor. You're going to see murder. You're going to see adultery, broken marriages. You're going to see everything that the last six commandments addresses. Why? Because the last six commandments are established on the foundation of the first four. Once you remove the first four, you don't get the last six. Now... I think we can all admit we need the last six commandments in our lives and in our society. But the problem with that is when you think that you can teach or implement the last six when you have not done anything about the first four. Now, with that in mind, come with me to Deuteronomy chapter number six. Deuteronomy chapter number six. And I want to show you something here in verse number 14. So Jesus said this in John 14, verse 15. He said, if you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. So what was Jesus saying? Jesus saying our honoring his word, our honoring his commandments would be based on our love for him. So is it any wonder when you look at the Ten Commandments that the first four deal with our relationship with God and then the last six deal with our relationship with man? How I treat my neighbor is a reflection of what I, of how I see my God. And I'm going to show this to you here, here in the Word uh, here in just a few minutes. Because we need to see this. And, and, and we need, to, as a church, as the church, we need to have a conviction that the way I see my brother, the way I see my neighbor in life should be a reflection of what I know about God. That's why the two great commandments that Jesus gives us is that number one, we love God, and number two, we love our neighbor as ourselves. But that second one's going to always fall short when that first one's not in place. Hallelujah. Because when I see a man, I need not see a color. I need to see an individual that was made in the image of an almighty God. When I see a man, I don't need to see rich or poor. I don't need to see class, social status. I don't need to see, I need to see a human being that was made in the image of God. Whether that man lives behind a gated community or whether he is living under a bridge, he was made in the image of a living God. Whether that man is incarcerated or whether that man is sitting in a political office, that man was made in the image of God. We have to recognize that all man was made in the image of God. My point is, is that the way we see each other begins with how we see God. So could the problem be in our society where violence and murder are taking over cities everywhere? Could the problem be that there is a disconnect with our young men when it comes to relationship with God? And could the result of that disconnect be that they weren't raised in a home where they had a mother and a father that taught them a relationship with God where honor was practiced in that home? I feel like we are experiencing what happens genera after generations of a disconnect with God. We're seeing the fruit of it. Now watch this in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 14. You shall not go after other gods. Of the gods of the people which are round about you. Lord said, don't be going after other folks' gods. Well, if there only be one God, and there is only one God, he showed up in three persons. I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute. Now I got a lot of movie talking about here in a minute, right? But there's one, one God. Anytime you read about another God, this is an idol. This is what man makes to be God. 
And a, a simple way of looking at idols would be to use uh, uh, the, the, the letter M, man. People have made man, even if it's themselves, God. Money, materials, music, movements. And I've added Mother Nature because we live in a society today where many people worship the earth and think the earth is God. If the earth is God, how come we trying to save it? It should be able to save itself. <laughs> Mother Nature, uh -uh, I don't use that term, Father God. I'm not worried about global warming. That's why the folk that were worried about global warming had to stop worrying about it and change the title because they recognized it wasn't really warming. So they changed it to climate change. I'm not worried about climate change. <gasps> oh, oh, he's not worried. I'm not worried about it because I read Genesis 8:22. As long as the earth remains, there will be cold and heat. There will be summer and winter. There will be seed time and harvest. God already said the climate's going to change. Don't worry about it. He's got the whole world in his hand. You see my point? Y'all waiting on another line. I'm one line wonder. That's it. One line wonder if you're going to get another one. So what, what have we made God? What, what has society made God? Is it man? Is it fame? Is it popularity? Is it uh, uh, music? Have you taken on an identity based on what you're putting in your ears every day? Is it money? Is it materials? Is it things? Is it movements? Is it the earth itself? What have we put before God? The Lord is saying here, you, will, you shall have no other gods before me. And then he, he, he expounds on that here in Deuteronomy 6, 14. And he says, not only do we not have any other gods, don't let the gods of the people around you become your God. Don't worship what other people worship. Don't worship what other people worship. Come with me, if you would, to the New Testament. I want to go to 2 John. That's toward the end of your Bibles. 2 John. I want to show you a verse here. 2 John chapter 1, and we'll look at it in verses 9 and 10. You know, we, we, we inevitably take on the image of what we worship. We take on the image of what we worship. And, and when there's idolatry in our life, we take on a false image. And so God has said, have no gods before me. I have consecrated you unto myself. How serious is, is God about that? I thought it'd be uh, important to read from the New Testament because so many times when you talk about the Ten Commandments or the law or these things that we've been dealing with, folk will say to you, well, that's the Old Testament. That's the Old Testament. As if we're supposed to just get rid of it. But Jesus taught in the New Testament that not only should the Old Testament commandment be honored, but that it should be honored to a greater degree. When you read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, he makes this statement in verse 19. In Matthew 5 verse 19, Jesus says, any person that keeps the commandments and teaches others to keep the commandments is great in the kingdom. Any man that breaks the commandments and teaches others to break the commandments is least in the kingdom. So my position in God's kingdom is based on my relationship with his commandments. And so what Jesus does in Matthew chapter 5, because he would be dealing with the people that would receive the spirit of God and have inner conviction of truth, he takes the commandments to a different level. And so he makes a statement like this. You have heard it said, thou shalt not kill. I say to you, if you have hate in your heart toward another, you're already a murderer. He's dealing with the root to murder. He then goes on to say, you have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But then Jesus said, but I say to you, if you lust after a woman with your heart, you have already committed adultery. So what's Jesus doing? He's amplifying the, the commandments, and he's addressing them at the heart where all sin starts. Sin does not start out here. It starts in our heart. That's why David said in Psalm 119, 11, Thy word, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I have to deal with hatred in my heart. I have to deal with lust in my heart. I have to deal with covetousness in in my heart and if I dress it in my heart it never shows up in my life so that's what Jesus does. Jesus I mean to say well well that's the Old Testament no he amplifies the commandment of God now look at this strong word in 2nd John chapter 1 
Is everybody there? 2 John chapter 1, verse 9. Let me get to the right one here. 2 John chapter 1, verse 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine or teaching of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine or teaching of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Here we go. Verse 10. If there come any unto you and bring not this Doctrine are this teaching, the commandments of God. Receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. God said, don't let false teachers up in your house. Now, you might read that and say, oh, man, I got to be careful to who, you know, rings my doorbell and who I open the door to. Mm -mm. No, there was a time when you had to worry about false doctrine coming through the front door. But now false doctrine don't have to come through the front door. It comes through the airways. It comes through your cell phone. It comes through your internet service. It comes through your satellite company. There's, the, 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 there's false teaching and influence that's available on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer, on your television. We have to have a level of protection and discernment when it comes to our children like no generation before us because evil can slip in any avenue now. Now, now, notice he's saying, don't let false teaching in your house. Don't let it in your house. Don't let it become influential in your home. Why? Because God has always desired that his people have a discernment and a respect between what was good and what, what is evil. That was Satan's message in the garden to Eve is that you don't need a God to define for you what is good and what is evil. You should be your own God and you should determine what is good and what is evil. That's the society that we're living in today. But the Lord says, as your God and you being my people, I want to reserve that right in your life for me to identify what is good, what is healthy, what is right, and what is evil, what is, is, is bad, and what, what, what would bring a uh, destruction on your life. God said, I reserve that right. And what does he tell Ezekiel? Ezekiel 44, 23, he says this, you shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. That's a part of knowing God is that I have that discernment and I'm able to separate what is in the will of God and in line with truth versus what is not. That was God's heart for the children of Israel when he brought them out of Egypt because here was a people that did not know God. They had been in Egypt 400 years. They didn't know this God. So what does God do? He brings them out. He leads them miraculously to the foot of this mountain where he showed up and meets with Moses for 40 days. And the Lord speaks to his children. He doesn't just give them commandments. He gives them a law. He gives them a blueprint for a tabernacle that they would build where he would dwell among them, where they would know that he was a God that was near and not one that was far off. He moved with them in that tent of dwelling. He was, he was a God unto them, and they were his people. That heart of God has not changed for you and I today. But what did he do? How was he to let these people know who he was? You say, well, he gave them the Ten Commandments. True. But he gave them more than that. He gave them the first five books of the Bible. The first five books of the Bible, the Torah, were words that the Spirit of God moved on Moses to write. So God took a people out of bondage that did not know who he was. He knew them, but they didn't know him. Oh, what you say? The Lord knew me when I didn't know him. Hallelujah. And he brings those people out of bondage and he says, hey, now let me tell you who I am. I know you've seen my wonders. I know you've seen my power, but I want you to know who I am. And so he gives Moses the first five books of the Bible. Now, how would this all wise God begin to reveal himself to his people so that he would be their God and they would be his people. How would he begin to make himself known to three and a half million people that had been in bondage for 400 years and never known him? What would this all wise God do? Where would he start? I'll tell you where he started. Genesis 1-1. 
He said, in the beginning, he took these children out of bondage and put them into a history class. Let me tell you your origin. Let me tell you where it all started. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The all-wise God said, the, the, the number one thing you need to know about me is that everything started with me. Now, that's what the all-wise God said. That's what the all-wise God knew that his children that had no knowledge of him. He said, this is what you need to know about me. You need to know about me that in the beginning, I created the heaven and the earth. So the first thing that God revealed to the children of Israel was that this I am God who becomes first became creator. Now, if I were the enemy, and I didn't want you to believe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I didn't want you to believe John 3.16. I didn't want you to believe the prophets. How would I begin to discredit the Bible? When you, when you have a, 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 a psalm like Psalm 22 that lists 29 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in one day, where thousands of years before it happened, it was prophesied that Jesus would die on a cross being pierced in his hands and his feet with nails. Now, how could every description of Jesus' life, from the place he was born to how he would die, be laid out thousands of years before the time? And you can prove this with the Dead Sea Scrolls and just study the archaeology and, the, and all the history of the Word of God coming together. And you know that it was written before it happened. So if you were the enemy, how would you challenge all that? Just start in the first verse. Because if you don't believe the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Word of God, then the whole rest is wiped out. And that's exactly what the enemy is trying to do. He says, okay, God, you started with what you did in the beginning. I will just erase what you did in the beginning, and I will replace it with an angry man's theory that himself later would contradict, and I would make that truth and make that science, and I will convince people that everything evolved from nothing. And since everything evolved from nothing, there is no creator behind anything. And if there be no creator behind anything, there's real no really no purpose behind anything. We're just all here as, as, as uh, 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 agents of, of, of nothing because that's where we came from. Not only do we find out in Genesis that he's the creator, we find out who he is. Because the first, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, because the first name that God used to reveal himself in Genesis was Elohim. When you read it in the Hebrew, Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, Elohim. Elohim. Elohim is a, is a plural name. To, to explain this, in the tabernacle, you had cherubim, two of them, on either side of the mercy seat. If you only had one, you would say that's a cherub. If you have more than one, you say cherubim. You had the I am. In Hebrew, you make that plural. And so God's first name in Genesis is Elohim, which gives himself the picture of one God in three persons. And so we see it in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Verse 3, and God said, and God said. So in verse 1, you have God. In verse 2, you have the Spirit of God. And in verse 3, you have the Word of God. One God in three persons responsible for all creation. Now, if that confuses you and you wonder how one God could show up in three persons, I give to you water. Because if I put this water in a freezer, I would have ice. But that ice is no less or no more water than this water. It is just water in another form. Or I could take this water and boil this water and create steam. And that steam is no less or no more water than this water. You cannot take water from water. It, whether it's ice or steam, it is still H2O. And whether it's God the Father, God the Spirit, or God the Son... One is no less or more, more God than the other. Hallelujah. He's one God in three persons. But when did the Spirit move? And how did God create? He created with his word. 
Genesis 1, 3, and God said. Verse 6, God said. Verse 9, God said. Verse 11, God said. Last verse, God saw. What was God telling the children of Israel? What's he telling us? I'll always see what I say. It puts power in his word. What else does it illustrate? That the spirit that was moving did nothing until the word was spoken. God was showing how he works, that he is God. He's in complete control. He's, he's the father of life. He's the beginning of everything. He's the Aleph. He is the Alpha. He is the start. His spirit moves to bring his will to pass, but his spirit will not work or accomplish until his word goes forward. He was showing how he works through the children of Israel, how he worked in creation, and how he works in you and me. All of that right there in Genesis. Why? So God's people could know him. So that God's people could know him so that they could be his people, and he could be their God. Let me show you what Jesus had to say about this in the Gospel of John. If you would, turn over to John chapter number 5. John chapter 5. The enemy works to attack the foundation of faith at its core, and that is creation. If you don't believe in creation, you're not going to believe in the fall, the fall of man, sin. And if you don't believe in the fall, you won't see the need for redemption. When you take the Bible from cover to cover and you try to break it down into three simple parts, you could come up with three very simple ones, creation, fall, and redemption. That God created the heavens and the earth a certain way, but man fell in the garden. Sin came into society, and it is the reason for all evil that we see. Man has fallen. He is broken. He is separate from God. And in that fallen state, there's no limits to what he might do. But it is, God, is it or was it God's heart to leave man, his creation, in this fallen state? No. And the Throughout the fabric of Scripture, God is laying out the plan where he, by his own blood, would redeem man from that fallen state back into a relationship with him so that he could see God as his creator, so that he could see God as the father of life and therefore find his purpose in this God. Once you take that out of society, once you take that out of the heart of any man or any woman, there's no limits to how far away from truth the individual can go when there's no conscience of God. That's what we're seeing in society. And when you think it can't go any further, it goes further. I wasn't alive in the 60s when, when creation in our schools was replaced with evolution. I, wa I wasn't here then. I wasn't born yet. But I'm sure there was some that thought, how could we believe that something came out of nothing? How could we teach our children that, that there was nothing and it blew up? Where, where is the fuel? Who lit the fuel? What was explosive? How was there a bang? How did nothing produce something? How, how did life come out of death? How, how, did, how did all of this come about out of nothing? It violates every, every part of science to believe that, that life comes out of death and that something comes out of nothing. I'm sure there were people in that day thought, oh, the, what, what is to come of our, our kids and our nation if we're going to teach that there is no creator? Oh, a lot came out of that because once you remove creator, everything he created loses his purpose. So what, when you read Genesis, what do you find? You find that God created heavens and the heavens and the earth. What was the last thing he created? What was the apex of his creation? Man. In whose image? His. Where was man's origin, his physical body? The dirt, dust. Man would, would be formed in, 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 in a variety of colors. But still man. His fashion may look different, but inwardly he's exactly the same. And then God looked at that man that was alone and said, this is not good that this man be alone. And Adam was a scientist because science means knowledge gained by observation. And he observed that all the creation had a mate. 
but he didn't have one. And so God said, I got to make Adam a mate like everything else has a mate. And God looked at man that was alone. He said, I need a solution for a single man. And the solution for a single man was not another man. The solution for a single man was a woman. And that woman was not another man. It was to take the man and, then, and make a womb man. That's what the word woman means, a womb man. So God took a man and said, now what do I need to change about this man that this man, womb man, could produce life? That this man, womb man, could be made pregnant, could, could actually do, uh, have a child, a human being, from seed for nine months develop in her womb and, 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 be, and, and be sanctified and safe in that womb to, to create an avenue for the body to hold Hold that baby for nine months and then, then, then release that child through birth and then have on site, on site nourishment. So God gave a woman something he didn't give a man. They were not implants. I'm not messing with nobody, I'm trying to say. It wasn't just about a look of attraction. It was about giving her the ability to nurse life. The reason a woman has the hips that she does is so she can have a baby. Everything that a man might look at in a woman and find attractive, she wouldn't have that if she didn't have the ability to bring forth life. God made a womb man, not a man with lipstick, a womb man. I don't say that to offend nobody. I'm saying that when you get away from God, you get away from purpose. And what does he do with this man that's a man? And what does he do with a man that actually has a womb? He puts the two together because to, together they reproduce. If they're separate, they never reproduce. A man could never produce a child without a woman. And a woman could never produce a child without a man. They need to be together. See, if God don't want it together, it won't reproduce. You can't put a cat with a dog and get a dad. <laughs> Two women can't reproduce. Two men can't reproduce. God is in control. If he don't want it together, it won't reproduce. You say, well, what about white and black? What about white and black? If you put a white man and a black woman together, can they reproduce? Yes. What about an Asian and a Hispanic? I don't care if it's male and female. They come together, they reproduce. Because all man was made in the image of God. But when you get away from God, you get away from purpose. So our godless society, our godless society has redefined marriage. Redefined identity that you can be what you want to be. That's a lie. You cannot be what you just want to be. It don't matter what you identify as. I'm saying this out of love. You can't be what you're not. I don't care what executive orders are signed by the White House. I'm telling you what God's house said. God, God has separated men from women, and they are distinctly different. There's no limits to how far man can go from truth when you evict God out. I don't say this out of hatred because there's no one that God does not love and there's therefore there's no one God cannot save. But if I can save somebody from letting this world's lies infect you to where you are confused about your purpose and your identity and you think you'll find wholeness if you change your identity. You are not going to find wholeness until you find the one that created you, the one that knew you before your mama knew your daddy, the one that knows your innermost being. There's a wholeness that only Jesus can give you and it doesn't come from identity change and it doesn't come from name change and it doesn't come from what you wear or how much money you make or how many followers you have on Instagram. There is a void in your heart that can only be filled by your creator he knows you and he loves you and no matter what you've been through or what your past may look like you cannot get so far from God that he cannot save you at this very minute because he loves you so 
So no matter what, what you've been through, no matter what it looks like, don't think that, that there's a disconnect that the blood of Jesus cannot resolve because he can. I, wanna, I need to close with this verse. I'm out of time. But let me, let me close with this verse. John 5, verse 46. For had you believed Moses, for had you believed Moses, it's Jesus talking, you would have believed me. Had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. The enemy is attacking the history God gave his people. With everything. The attack on the word of God is as old as the word itself. We have to have the discernment to recognize when the enemy is perverting truth just for the sake of dishonoring God. You bring God glory. When you do what he called you to do. When you fulfill the purpose that he gave you. There is nothing more beautiful than something fulfilling its purpose. Whether that's an eagle soaring a lion roaring, or a hummingbird extracting from a flower. We're in awe of something fulfilling its purpose. The dolphin coming out of the water, the whale in its size and enormity, the power of a great white. We're captured by creation and nature when it does what it's created to do. The waves of the sea coming to the sand and then going back again. The sunrise, the sunset, the moon in perfect harmony, in perfect order, a perfect system. Month after month, week after week, we're in awe of the harmony of God's creation and the fulfillment of everything he created its purpose. So what breaks me today is that the apex of God's creation, man and woman, are missing it. And you have so many people looking for purpose outside of the heart of God. And you see man become something he was never intended to be, a murderer, a hater, a thief, a liar, an adulterer. Not because those things are bad and evil in and of themselves, but what they do to a society when there's no respect for God and man. And we're living in that society. And I look around when I drive down the street or look at the news and I see brokenness everywhere. I see trash. I see filth. I see a lack of self-respect. I see a lack of self-worth. I see men and women that have no self-worth, no self-respect. You see it in the way they talk, the way they dress, the way they treat one another. It's like what's happened to us. What's happened to us is that we are without our God. And until we get back to him, until we get back to worship, until we get back to a recognition that he is the creator, he's the beginning of all things. He sent his son because he loves me, not because I am perfect, not because I have it all together. No, none are perfect. None have it all together. But he loved me anyway. He showed he me his love and that while I was a yet sinner, Christ died for me so that I could know him and that in worshiping him, I could find me in worshiping him. I could see his plan for me, his purpose for me, find my identity in him. That's the only hope of this world. I want to pray for you this morning, and then I want to pray with you. Father, we thank you today for your word. And we acknowledge that every single one of us have sinned, broken your commandments, whether it be in our life or in our heart, we all stand before you guilty. None of us are without sin. I'm not without sin. And we are in no position to judge another. Lord, will you forgive us? Forgive us. 
redeem us. For those that are here or watching this live stream that may not know you, may this be the day. Father, do what no man can do. Draw them to you by your spirit. For those that are struggling today with identity, and I know it's real. And if you're here today or you're watching and you're struggling with your identity, don't follow the gods of this world. You are fearfully and you are wonderfully made and you are beautiful in his sight. He knows the number of hairs on your head. Before you were formed in your mother's belly, he knew you. And there's a purpose he has for your life. And he loves you so much. He loves us all so much that he takes us the way he finds us. But he also loves us so much that he doesn't leave us the way he found us. You don't have to struggle with your identity. You don't have to struggle with your purpose. Your creator, your God, your father has a plan for you. He could have formed you in the womb any way he wanted to form you. He has a purpose for you. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world because we all would stand condemned. But he sent his son into this world to save the world. He didn't come to condemn me. He came to save me. I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I agree with your word. All have sinned and fallen short of your glory. I know I have. I ask forgiveness. I believe you love me. You sent your son to die for my sins. You raised him from the dead. So I would not have to be afraid of death. That I could walk with you now into eternity. I ask that you would fill me with your spirit. Have your way in my life. Use my life. Consecrated. Sanctified. Separated. For you and your glory. Use my life to make you known to the world around me. In Jesus' name, amen.